All right, good morning, everyone. It's uh, 10 o'clock right on the money. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time out to come to, firstly, the Open Book Festival. It's lovely to see everyone in person and not to be doing this over Zoom or such platforms. It's lovely that technology enabled us to connect over the last two years, but nothing beats face-to-face -face and in-person conversations. My name is Africa Milane, and I have the joy and the easy job of having a conversation with these three amazing authors. Um, the books are deeply personal in very different ways. Uh, Rofio Amaneta has written A Man, A Fire, A Corpse, um, a book that is at once a tribute and a celebration of his father, uh, but at the same time a commentary on what is a reality for many South Africans, which is the state of crime in this country and the impact that it has on us. His father was uh, known as a top cop in Soweto, and uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation, Rafael Maneta. Lovely to have you here. Thank you for having me. That's where you clap. <laughs> <laughs> and then next to him is Sarah Jane McCullough King, uh, a friend and a colleague and a fantastic author and writer. This is her second book, Mad Bad Love and How the Things We Love Nearly Kill Us. And when we arrived here earlier to do sound check and make sure we were ready for you, she asked, did you enjoy the book? <laughs> and I went, not quite the question to ask, Sarah Jane, because it is heartrending in many ways. It is deeply personal and reflective and brutally honest. Um, and uh, it's a book that is, when you consume it, I'm going to suggest you read a few chapters, put the book down, come back to it the next day, read a few more chapters. Don't try and read it all in once because it is going to be overwhelming. Having said that, it is a fantastic read. You will laugh out loud at times and at times you're gonna to want to throw things at the wall and I suggest soft toys because it's gonna be easier that way. I'm looking forward to this conversation, Sarah Jane, and thank you very much for the book. And Haji Mohammed Davji, her second book, Here's the Thing, very different from her first book, <laughs> totally. Uh, here is a collection of essays, of vignettes, of thoughts, of reflections on a variety of things. She does tackle some of the contemporary issues, the July 21st unrest, for example, uh, <coughs> the ever-growing challenge of being a woman in a patriarchal society that <coughs> is South Africa, but also goes deeply personal. Uh, she opens a book with a very, very wonderfully written and heartbreaking letter to her late father and really starts you off in a way that forces you to deal with love, affection, mortality, uh, sorrow, regret, I suppose, to some ways, and really a fantastic read and one that's going to make you chuckle as much as it's going to make you cry. Here's the thing is the title of the book. Lovely to have you here. Um, same question to all three of you, and I'll start with you, Haji, and let's get the necessary but uh, boring question out of the way. Why the book? Oh, because I had nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think it was, I, I mean, I, actually, I just do love writing. People always say you hate writing and you love having written. For me, it's the opposite. I love writing when I hate having written, because then the job's done. But I think it was a nice point of departure from uh, Sorry Not Sorry, which was the first book, um, because I'd ex ex experienced a lot of growth, um, a lot of changes, a lot of changes in perspective. Um, there was the pandemic, there was death, um, you know, there was becoming a parent. And the book didn't start out the way it ended. It was, it was I think, very much similar to Sorry, Not Sorry, in that it was um, thematically more political uh, and heavier politically uh, and dealt a lot more with race and identity and that kind of thing. And, and then after having all these experiences, I just, my life closed off in certain ways, but in other ways my mind opened up for a lot more nuance. Um, and so it evolved into, into this. And I just thought, there's so many people who probably have these questions um, that we're potentially not allowed to ask. Um, so why not, eh? And, and briefly on the process, did, as you say, the way it started out is not how it finished. 
uh, did you did you go into it thinking this is going to be a book, or were you really just writing a collection of essays that you may or may not have turned into a book eventually? I think from the original draft, there were three drafts of this book because I was so ill and like neurologically deficient that after I gave the first three drafts to my wife to read, and please understand that three drafts equates to 180,000 words, so that's a lot. Um, she would literally read them and put it down and go, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and then <laughs> I'd be like, I, was, I thought I was writing so well, and, and, but none of it would make sense because I just wasn't functioning neurologically. So there, but, and during that experience itself, the way I was thinking about things and my experiences and you know, my engagement with the world was also changing. So I think maybe I kept one chapter from all the drafts that I did in, in this book and then everything else was just fresh. Yeah, fantastic book. Sarah Jane, same question to you, why the book? I always knew after Killing Caroline that there was gonna be another book. I had no idea it was gonna be Mad Bad Love. Um, again, yeah, I, I, I love writing, except when I hate writing. Um, I love writing when I'm in charge. What I don't love is writing when Melinda Ferguson, um, <laughs> my, my publisher, is in charge. Um, and, and I'd been taught, you know, when I, the day I handed in the manuscript for Killing Caroline, I started writing that. But I didn't know it was going to be that. I thought it was going to be something else. And then sort of life happened and you know, I had a baby and all sorts of things happened. And then the fear, the difficult second album fear kicked in. And I couldn't write. I really, you know, I really struggled. And then I started doing a bit here and there. And Melinda said, right, are we going to do this or not? If you do it, I do it. I'll do it, she said. And she's actually got a new book coming out. And so I said, OK, cool. Always up for a challenge. Um, two Leos. We're hugely competitive. And she said, right. And so that was it. And, and, and yeah, I, I'm a writer, I guess. So I, I write. And, and that's, yeah. Was it always going to be this brutally honest? Yeah. Otherwise, what's the point in writing memoir? Mm. Absolutely pointless. Mm. Otherwise, I could have just written fiction. I re I'm such a believer in that. I really do, you know, the, the whole thing of laying, laying oneself bare. You don't get all of Sarah Jane McCoyla King in that book. It's, it's, a, it's a snapshot of, of bits of life. But the bits I write about are my truth and my absolute truth. Um, and I think Caroline gave me, Killing Caroline gave me the gift of that in terms of setting the foundation that everything I will ever write, whether it be fiction or non-fiction or whatever, but, but certainly, yeah, it, of course, of course. So there's, there's, there's the thing, and Sasanke Samang always says it, and I credit her, and she always says, it's not me that says it, but write from your scars, not your wounds. I don't do that. I don't write completely from my wounds because that would just be a diatribe of utter misery, which isn't what I'm trying to do. But there, there, some, some stuff I will never be, there will never be scars. It will always be a wound. And that's okay. Um, I did an interview a few years ago and, and the headline that came out was, people don't want to read your unadulted misery. And I was like, you need to take that headline down because that's, <laughs> that's my bread and butter. Maybe they do want to read your unadulterated misery. But that people, I think, particularly with memoir, it's about relation, isn't it? You don't have to have gone through everything that I've gone through in order to relate to aspects yeah. of what I write about. Um, and I owe it to people who read that to write honestly. Yeah. Brutally honestly sometimes. Rafua? Uh you have a cool dad, and I suppose <laughs> that's why you wrote the book, right? Um, yeah, I mean, not necessarily. Like, I mean, I also stumbled into the book. Um, I'd initially, I was writing a book of short stories, so I was writing fiction, um, and then I was shopping that out. No one really wanted it at the time. Um, and so I tweeted that I was writing an essay about my father, um, about his 30 plus years as a, you know, sort of detective, um, and my publisher happened upon that tweet. Um, and she said, I'd like to offer you a book deal. And I said, sure. Um, and then I suddenly had a book to write. Um, but yeah, I'd always been a journalist, which means, you know, you know, you write something and it's done. You know, everything is fitted into, you know, your long form article, 2,000 words. And now I suddenly had, you know, a book to write, which was 100 plus 
um, which was 100 plus pages. So, I mean, that kind of speaks to why I chose the form. Like, it's, it's, it's very episodic. Yeah. So, like, I'll write a vignette and then I'll go off on a tangent and then I'll come back to it. Um, yeah, I mean, one that had to do with sort of like my training as a journalist. I'm always used to writing a particular story and then, like, leaving it completely. Um, but I was also reading a book called The Invention of Solitude by Paul Oster um, on Earth, who were briefly gorgeous by Ocean Vang. And he also does a similar thing, like he was writing to his mother um, and he'd write and then he'd go off on a tangent for two or three pages and circle back. Um, and so that's why the book is written as it is. You know, I might write two or three lines and then like three pages later, go back to those lines. But essentially it was a book about how I wanted to find out also for myself, how is it that, you know, you investigate a murder in the morning and then you come back home and help your kids with your homework. Mm. Um, that's essentially some of the things I wanted to look through. Which <clears throat> is difficult enough when you're doing it with a subject matter you don't know. You add then the complexity of being the son, one of twins, or actually three brothers in total, but you're a twin, yeah. who your father has to help with preparing dinner and you know homework and all of that kind of thing. And it is your father who's going out every day and putting his life in danger to obviously fight crime. Yeah, and I mean, I, that's why I say in the book, like I make, he made the distinction as well and I was trying to make the distinction too. There was never, there was never a way, there was, this was never going to be like a 100% journalistic objective account because I'm obviously writing about my father. And I think I say it in the book as well, like, you know, he makes a distinction about truth and fact. The idea that truth is sort of like grounded in the facts of a matter, um, no, sorry, the other way around. Fact is sort of like grounded in objectivity. He made an example like, you know, um, he said he dealt with facts completely. Like someone might come in to report a hijacking and say the car was blue when it was actually navy. You know, they'd be telling the truth, but they wouldn't be factual. Um, and I found that like very interesting, sort of like that very thin line. And in the end, I actually say, you know, he would have preferred me to write the facts about his career, but I think the truth made a more interesting mm. account. It certainly does. Mm. Is he proud of the book? Uh, yeah, he enjoyed it. Uh, I mean, it is, I'm not going to lie, I have a very complicated relationship with the book. Like, it kind of feels like emotional pornography. Um, yeah, like, I mean, on, okay, maybe for lack of a better term, but I mean, these are very serious things. Like, my dad was talking about, for example, in the book, how he had to look for a man's arm for, like, a, a day. And, you know, I'm sort of, like, writing and I'm trying to, you know, uh, make it very literary and beautiful, but these were all very serious things to him. So, yeah, he likes the book, but I think I have a very complicated relationship with it. And does it vary every day? Like, is your complication with the book more pronounced today than it was yesterday, and what determines that? I, I haven't finished it, like, since handing it in. I haven't, I, I haven't read it from start to finish since, really? since it was published, yeah. Wow. And how many months ago was it? But four or five months ago it was yeah, published, yeah? Yeah, like March, yeah. Yeah. Haji, your dad sadly <clears throat> passed away and passed away at a time when your relationship with him was finding itself again because there was a difficulty between the two of you for, for a significant amount of time. I think the word you're looking for is forever, but <laughs> we can shorten it to a significant <laughs> amount of time. Um, yeah, it was, I mean, I, it was such an emotional roller coaster because my dad and I had always have always had a very tortured relationship, um, which in he made me feel extremely small. Um, and as a result, I made myself feel very small just to stay out, you know, the way. Um, and it was abusive. It was really, really abusive, both physically and emotionally. Um, I mean, he, he basically had no faith that I would amount to anything in my life and sent me off at a very, very young age. I think it was child labor, actually, um, to go and pack groceries at an OK Bazaar. Who remembers OK Bazaar? <laughs> <laughs> For the young ones, it's a thing. It's a thing. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think that was his way of saying to me, this is what your life is destined for. Not that there's anything wrong with that, of course. Um, but comparatively to my siblings, I had a very different father. Um, and then, you know, three years before he died, or a couple of years before he died, our relationship just really started to mend itself. Um, and he apologized to me for everything um, in those three years, and then on his deathbed as well. 
And when he was lying on his deathbed, I, I love telling the story, not because it makes me look good, but because it's, just, it's legitimately quite funny. Um, so he had a brain tumor, and he had surgery to have it removed, and he told us 90% um, of it was removed. But he lied, so only 10% that was removed was the other way around. And then he did nothing about it for five years. He was just like, I'm fine. And then one day it just kicked in. There was nothing left to do. Tried surgery again, went to coma. It was just a really, really long, long process. And then he just came home, and, and, and my dad's a professor, so his brain is his, you know, his whole life. So is all of ours, I guess, if we use it. I don't. Um, <laughs> and... So he couldn't speak, you know, he couldn't chew, he couldn't eat, he couldn't swallow. He was just ready to die, basically, and one night he called me and he asked me for his gun. He said, bring me my gun. Um, I can't, this is not how I want to live. And the next day after that, he did, he did die, but he managed to utter words to, with three kids, and to my brother he said, stop dressing like you're poor. <laughs> I don't work this hard so that you can be poor. And... Um, he made my mom open his cupboards and show her what to give him in terms of his clothes because he always took great pride in his appearance because he grew up, he grew up really, really, really poor in a township. Um, and to my sister, he said, while the cupboards are open, can you see how neat everything is? I want you to pack everything neatly. And then he didn't say anything. Oh, he said to me, you're in charge of the family now because uh, my dad was also a very big feminist. Um, but then he didn't say anything else to me. And when he... When they left the room, he called me closer with a very, very small voice, and he said, I want you to know that you've always been my favorite, and I'm sorry about everything. And um, out of all my kids, you have a spark and a fire, and I think I was the way I was because I just wanted to light it some more, and you were strong, and I tested you, but I went too far, and I really, really apologize, but just know I've, I've always loved you the most. And it was so gratifying in that moment, but after that moment, it was just, I was so upset because I was just like, you had my whole life to tell me that. Mm. And you waited until the day you died. And now we have nowhere else to go with this relationship. Sorry, I always get so emotional when I tell that story, but it's very funny, don't you think? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I have a very peaceful relationship with death as well. Like, I mean, it's worryingly peaceful sometimes, I think. Um, and I really did, I believe in a, a assisted suicide or whatever the more democratic term for that is. And if I could, I would have helped him with that. But I couldn't. And then on the other hand, if I did, maybe I wouldn't have heard those words. So, yeah. And... And was it the hearing of those words? Was it the <clears throat> anger that you just reflected on that you felt in terms of lost opportunity, lost time, all of that, that then spurred you to write that letter? Yeah, the letter is complicated because it's both an act of accepting who he was, accepting who I am, or who I'm growing into being, um, but also just a reflection and an interpretation of my anger and my pain. And I, I guess also just letting the world know who he was. Because um, he was different to my siblings and he was different to the world. But he was, I was cheated out of many things, including an education, whatever. I had to pay for all of that, you know, myself. And... I mean, this is a man who worked his way up into being a professor, and he could, he could have helped, but he didn't. You know, I was the kid who waited until the very last minute for the textbook to be at the library so that I could study. And, God, I hate academics. I did so badly anyway, so I don't know why I bothered to get the textbook. But, you know, it just, it just intentionally made me suffer and, and struggle, and I could never understand why. And to this day, I do things and I go, like, will, will Dad be disappointed or will he be proud? Mm. Um, and one day I woke up and I was like, why am I still asking myself if a dead man is going to be proud of me? 
but recently all this has been reactive and reactionary in me again because I have no job. I am completely unemployed. I have never been this person. I've literally been employed since the age of 12. And now I'm just like, I am literally my father's biggest disappointment. Like, it's true. I have lived out his Except expectations. Except you are writing exceptionally good books. And yeah. Which aren't selling, to... so please buy them. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> Here's the thing. You're available <laughs> downstairs. Um, Sarah Jane, you, you also have a very intriguing and fascinating journey uh, of discovery, really, as far as your father is concerned. Mm. Um, uh, I mean, he, it's not the focal point of the book, but mm. it's a relationship that is important to you. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that was, that, that was another thing, so I kind of to go back to the, the, your, your first question, was there was such an expectation the, the meeting of my dad <clears throat> was such a big event. It was like a media event <laughs> almost, um, which was great because that, that led to the finding of, of my dad. But also then, um, I felt as if there was an expectation that the next book would be about him. And it isn't. Um, there's a small chapter in the book that yeah. talks about our meeting. But... So, so that, that weighed quite heavily, and I kept saying, you know, people are going to be so disappointed, people are going to be so disappointed, but I don't write for people, mm. <laughs> so I thought. Um, and, yeah, it, it, is a, it is a very special relationship, and, and one that I, I don't go into in the book for two reasons. One, it's a very, very new thing. It's very new, and I think people's... But because of because of how we view adoption and therefore how we view adoption reunion, the message that was given when I met my dad was, "Oh, wh what a great happy ending!" And I was like, "Hold on a minute, it's not a happy ending at all." I spent 37 years without this man, um, largely due to the system of apartheid and also, you know, all these other factors. So for me, it wasn't a happy ending. It was a happy moment right. that I met my dad, right? But I. It, there was also, there's, there has been and continues to be an awful lot of grief processing around what I've missed out on. Um, and I'm one of four siblings on my dad's side, and, or four children on my dad's side, and we all get together and it's amazing, but I'm still an outsider. Yeah. I don't speak Sepedi, so uh, there's mm. still that, right? They're all having a conversation and I'm kind of going, Dumela. <laughs> and that's as far as we go you know what I mean and, and, and it, it's funny in a sense but it also isn't of course also, you know as Haji just said siblings have different experiences of their parents right but mine is completely removed mm. um, there's no frame of reference I look to my siblings often to tell me who our dad is Right. And, and I just came back from, from, from Joburg, and, and my brother and I, particularly my, my youngest brother, uh, W. So and I, are particularly close. And I rely on him to teach me about our father. And, and we can never get those years back, but um, we have. And people always say, do you have a great relationship? We have a great relationship for two strangers who met at 37 and 64. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that's painful, but it's also wonderful. And it's also wonderful, you know, I'm a Makwala, it's on the book. My dad, shame, he cried when he saw the book. My dad's as emotional as I am. Um, so he came to my book launch in Joburg and, and he, he saw, he, I hadn't told him that I'd officially taken his name and he was quite emotional about that. Understandably. Yeah. Uh, Enver yeah. um, is a father who's focused on and Enver is the father of your first child. Yeah. Um, We'll get to the second one now. Um, <laughs> no, we won't. Um, <laughs> he, he, he's a man you met and you fell in love with. And fell in love with uh, almost as a, um, you refer to it as violent. <laughs> the, the, you know, it, wasn't, it wasn't the R&B, lovely Hollywood movie kind of, you know, uh, here are roses, let's cook, and there's some music in the background. No. It, it, was, it was hectic. Yeah, we met in <laughs> psychiatric facility. Don't recommend Those that. Those are the best relationships. <laughs> um, we, we, met, we met in the clinic, and I was there because I was, um, I was trying to kill myself every day, and he was there because he was detoxing from heroin, a match made in crazy town. Um, 
And I remember walking down this hallway and my arms were, I was bandaged from here to here because I was just trying to take myself out the whole time. And I, had a, I was on suicide watch, so I had a nurse that used to shame Felicia. She's still out there somewhere, probably. She used to, like, follow me around. She had to follow me to the loo, and it was just that I'd managed to escape from Felicia. And I was walking down the hallway, and the most beautiful human being I'd ever... You've met him. Mm. He's not bad on the eye, is he? He's not. (laughs) He's Um, not at all. (laughs) And the most beautiful... But but not just aesthetic, but just the most... There was something about this energy, and, and, and it took me a very long time to really... I romanticised what that was. The truth was we were two absolute maniacs. I was trying to kill myself and he was detoxing from heroin. It wasn't quite the romance story and for a very long time I, I believed it was because meeting Enver, the day after I met him, I woke up and a few days after that I woke up and I woke up and I woke up and I, I realised I didn't try and kill myself today because the, the thought, the prospect of seeing and spending time with this incredible energy, this person who made me feel safe and like not wanting to kill myself and, and that was the reality and yeah, then you, then, then you go on to what happened. Indeed um, and in fact what, what we were reflecting on earlier as we were doing a sound check is that the last time you were at an open book festival live in person that's when you were pregnant. Yeah. And you discovered this pregnancy uh, in Stellenbosch, I believe. I was, I'd gone to Stellenbosch to do, excuse my Afrikaans, Vrutfius. <laughs> and um, and Enver had said to me, we'd, we'd been trying for a baby, and, and he'd said to me, well, you're pregnant. And I said, no, it's going to, you know, I've, all the crap I've done to my body over the years, it's going to take a while. And I go to the Drodsky Theatre in Stellenbosch, and, and there was a, what was I even doing? I don't know. I was talking about killing Caroline, probably. And I had a pregnancy test in my bag, and then I did the test, and I was pregnant, and it was just the happiest. I took a picture because, you know. Uh, of what? Yeah, well, the pregnancy test. Of the, oh, oh, I was like, <laughs> of the test. So many things. Can of the moment. Yeah, I don't know. The lavatory. Thank you for the of test. The, <laughs> no, of the, of the test, which I still, I've still got that test. Is that weird? A little bit. Uh, yeah, and, and it, was the, it was the happiest moment of my life. It was just, this was everything, everything I wanted. I was pregnant with the child of the love of my life. And then. Do you want to give a synopsis of And Then? I always worry because I, 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 I did devour the book and, and I don't want to share too much. No, no, because, we, can, we can share. Yeah. So, so six weeks after... Uh, six weeks after finding out I was pregnant, I had discovered that uh, Enver had relapsed on heroin. And from... (laughs) And from week number... Yeah, so I think I was 12 weeks pregnant the last time I saw him before our daughter was born. I went to Hardy and Rebecca. Do you remember when I came Mm. around for dinner? Yeah. I was finished, hey? And I went to one of your classes with you. (gasps) Hardy... (laughs) I'm a lovely person. No, listen. <laughs> when I was about... You don't know this. I when do I was, not. When I was about... I was heavily pregnant. And a friend of mine in the UK had said... I said, give me some advice. She said, go to an antenatal class. It'll be full of complete wankers, but it'll, you'll get a lot out of it. <laughs> and so I went, and, and I, I'd been to dinner with at Harji and Rebecca, and I was like... And someone told me... <laughs> true, no. Someone, and, and, and someone told me to go... To, and Harji said, I'll go with you. And I went, really? And we went to this day, because my antenatal group, we continue three years down the line to be friends. They all were convinced that we were married. <laughs> um, and, the, and they were like really right on because, you know, these two black women have come in, these two black lesbians have come in to our white space. and da, da, da. It's the stuff of legend. Um, and we went and, and Haji said, and somebody said to Haji, this is the stuff of legend. Somebody said, it's so good of you to come. And Haji said, well, I did put the baby in there. <laughs> <laughs> Anything can happen. <laughs> and I imagine all of this was happening because Enver was not Because Enver was sitting on Weinberg train station smoking and injecting heroin into his eyeballs, <clears throat> essentially. And I'm making a joke about it, but it's not funny. It was the absolute, without doubt, most worst period of my life. 
Because also I have a lot of mother stuff, you know, I'm an adopted person, there was mother stuff, there was suddenly the thought that I was going to have a baby on my own, and literally he disappeared, I didn't know if he was dead or alive. His family and I don't have a good relationship, so that, that I was cut off completely, and I've, the, and ended back up in the clinic where he and I had met, and, and to, to carry a child, and it be for that to be the most joyous thing, but you also want to kill yourself, right? So you're, it, it was just, it was, I'm so sorry about the language for the young impressionables at the back. It was fucked. It was just such a horrible, horrible situation. And, and I knew I wasn't going to not have the baby. So what terrified me even more was that I was going to, but I knew I couldn't do it. And the first words of the book are, I'm a bad mother. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact... A lot in the book, you are quite hard on yourself. You are quite, um, not self-deprecating necessarily, but you, you, you're very judgmental. It's, it's as if you are standing in front of a mirror and you're going da, 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 but in a way that is also, you're not just doing it for emotional porn, you are doing it because you obviously are feeling a need that this is something that must be done. Motherhood is a really, I really hope it's like a feminist book also because motherhood is is a is a whole other story that and we don't talk about it enough and there was a I write about this moment in the book where with the eternal question that is asked to women um and and particularly to single mothers is how do you do it because we have to what other possible answer is there? Because society gives us no choice, because that's what there is to do. There's a kid to be raised, so we raise it. Um, and, and it's not rocket science. And, and the idea, and people kept saying to me, of all genders during my pregnancy, you've got to do it for you and the baby. You'll do it because, you know... And I was like, I'm telling you, I know myself. I can't do it. Um, I can't do this. And, and as if just by virtue of having a womb and a vagina, there's some kind of, like, maternal thing. It's nonsense. The maternal instinct is the creation of the patriarchy to kind of go, oh, but we can't do anything here because we don't have the vagina and the thing. So, like, you need... No, definitely not. Um, and, and I did do it, but I... I, I and I continue to <coughs> doubt myself as, as, a, as a mother because... Because that... Because, because I just do. Um, yeah. Yeah. And Rafael, I will come to you in a moment, but I just want to continue on this mother track because you do write an essay on, on motherhood mm. and you too share very similar sentiments. It's not all rosy. No, I mean, I, I, have, to, I have to just confess to the audience that my essay on, on motherhood or parenthood rather is, I think, a lot less... Well, it's significant, but it's 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 a lot less serious than than Sarah Jane Jane's, and and it's intentionally that way because it's just so hard. Yeah, I think if if you don't laugh through being a parent, you will just cry all the time. Um, and I do, I do. At night, secretly, I listen to Adele, and I just weep. <laughs> And I ask myself questions like, I used to have money. <laughs> and, you know, I could just Netflix and chill. <laughs> or, do you know, when I saw something in the store, I didn't have to buy it for someone else. I could buy it for myself. Um, but there are things, and there are things that, are that, that seem quite fickle. Like, my biggest things that I stress about sometimes at night time is like, oh, my God, I've got to teach this kid how to ride a bike at some yeah. point. Or, oh, my God, I, got, I, I hate cold water, but someone's got to teach him how to swim. You know, like, there's, there's all these things, and they seem like little things, but they're not. Because if you don't, who else is going to do it? Or you're like, oh, he's got such a great musical ear. Like, do I do something with this now? Do I wait? Like, what must do can happen? You know, there's, like, all this stuff, and you're just trying to be, do the best you can do with what you have. Um... And I hate those, I actually just, you're a liar. If you're a parent or a new parent and someone comes to you and says, how does it feel to have a new baby? And they go, oh, it's wonderful, it's the 
best thing that ever happened to me. It's changed my life. And like, I'm like, fuck you. <laughs> you're actually fucking lying because it's the worst and you're dying inside and society doesn't allow you to say that. Yeah, that. Yeah. That. And so now you can't say it. But here's my essay. Let me say it for you. It is a literal heap of burning shit. Yeah. <laughs> and we're just trying to get ourselves out with little buckets of water and, you know, sometimes it's not working. So, yeah. In a later essay, though, where you're talking about your status of your relationship with your wife, you do make reference beautifully to the meaning of this child to you and to Beck. Oh, 100%. I mean, two things can be true at the same time, Very right? True. And I Very think, true. especially in the time that we live in with many, like a variety of topics, you know, whether it's gender or... or body politics or, you know, like, whatever. Mm. Um, we've come to a point where our stance is very sort of, like, black and white. Mm. You know, it's very this or that. Um, and even in this entire book, I'm just like, but two things can be true at the same time. You can agree with something and question it at the same time. Um, and so saying that sometimes I hate being a mother is not the same as saying that I hate my child. Thank yeah. you. Because I love him tremendously. Like... There have been times when I have fought with, with nursery school kids, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they have to real, like, I don't speak to the teachers, I'm just not that kind of parent. My wife takes responsibility in being social and, like, you know, whatever. But if a kid comes at my kid, I will whisper in his ear, I will break your face. <laughs> And so my wife tries to keep me away from the school as much as she can, because I'm ready to go, man. I mean, like, I was a school teacher. I don't care how old you are. Um, I'm not abusive in any way. <laughs> Please do not take this the wrong way. But, <laughs> but, you know, like, and I think you agree, like, two things can be true 100%. at the same time. You know, he, he changed our lives. He, he's so funny and, and beautiful and... And also just a fucking wrecking ball. Yeah. And, you know, I, I love him to bits, but sometimes I don't like him very much. Yeah. I love the choices we made for our lives and where we're at and how we're growing, but sometimes I don't like those choices, yeah. you know, and it's fine. It's absolutely fine to say that as a mother. Rafia, I imagine you would resonate with that. I mean, you, you're a father, I suppose you come at it from a slightly different point of view to the two mothers here, but you would resonate with a lot of what's been said here. Yeah, I mean, maybe in the sense that, because I am my kids, like, sort of, um, what do you call it, primary caregiver, like, sort of the same type of things, yeah, like, you love your kid, but sometimes you just don't necessarily like being a parent. Mm. Um, yeah, so, yeah, a lot of overlay over there. Uh, maybe not as violent as, you know, <laughs> I'm going to paint your face. Um, <laughs> how, how much... How much pressure is on you, do you think, um, given the father you've had, uh, who perhaps from perception is seen as this great achiever, mm -hmm. top cop of Soweto, uh, really breaking and uh, successfully investigating a number of very important crimes that led to successful prosecutions, and, and yet able to be home sufficient times for you to remember the cooking and the homework mm -hmm. and all of that. How much pressure does that put on you as a dad? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I say in the epilogue that I hope my son like inherits my um, father's courage. I think was a very, very courageous man. Um, yeah, and, and, and I think it was difficult. Like you say, the idea that, you know, you'd you know, do all of everything he had to do in the morning and still sort of show up and be human. Um, I don't know, like, I think I, I, I try not to judge myself. I, I mean, the book is quite flattering for my father, but, I mean, I don't, th there are a lot of things I don't mention in the book. The fact that he was, like, extremely paranoid. I mean, he slept with a rifle under his bed, like, for decades. Like, I, I, but, but rightfully so, because in one of the chapters you share um, a, a visit from somebody who was looking for your father, and it was just you kids in the home, and obviously... At that age, it reads like you are aware of what your dad was doing, but you had no idea how dangerous it was. And, and, and then you start reflecting on the paranoia of your dad in, from that point on in the book. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, absolutely. But I mean, just what I mean is, you know, the, the book, obviously, and it was intentional. It, it, you're obviously, like, portraying 
him in a very particular light, you know what I mean? Because you're trying to do something like journalistically, like I had literary ambitions, like I was trying to fulfill with the book. Um, and at the end of the day, I wasn't going to write like a negative book about my father. But like, you know, I think, yeah, fatherhood, like parenthood as a whole, like it's exceptionally difficult. Um, yeah, as a kid, I didn't understand like why he had this preoccupation with safety. I mean, to this day, like he's still, like it's an impulse. He'll ask me, where are you? Like he, like literally before the talk, is like, are you safe? I'm like, I'm 31, you can't ask me those questions <laughs> anymore. Like, uh, but yeah, like he, yeah, still very preoccupied, still super, super paranoid. If anything, like I'd want my son to uh, inherit like my, my father's courage, number one. Um, I'd want him to inherit all of the good things my, you know, that the job didn't take away from my father. So the idea of showing up without an excuse you know, the idea that, you know, I, you know, I might be a homicide detective, but I still, and because he believed, like, fatherhood was a calling, like, I'm still, you know, I've been called to be your father, I'm going to show up the best way I can. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and in that respect, I'd say, yeah, the pressure, yeah. Uh, I can't remember who said this, who said we love people sometimes because of their limitations. Yeah. Does that resonate with you and your father? That there were limitations there, and despite or in spite of that, you actually still love him? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a very good question. <coughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know, like, I think even part of the book was um, was trying to, you know, sort of, like, close a loop on, 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 on our relationship, like, as father and son. He, when I wrote the book, a, a while after it was published, he, he said, thank you. And I said, what are you thanking me for? It was like, um, you know, I worked as a detective for 34 years. Like, you know, I've gone into homes where, you know, um, you know, a father mowed down, like, his entire family with gunfire. Like, I've had to investigate rapes. I look for a man's arm for a day. In that 34 years, no one's ever asked me, like, how did that make you feel? Yeah. You're the first person, like, ever mm. to ask me, like, okay, cool, but how, how did it make you feel to investigate the case? I know you solved it. But like, how did you? Mean? And I think you know, yeah. After after that, like, it, it was easier to be a bit more forgiving of his limitations because you understand that you know he was just like human. You know, he was just doing the best he could. Worked like a, a um, even to maybe to allude to the title. It's called a man of fire corpse. It speaks to some of the resources, uh, the lack of resources in yeah. policing. On my dad's first day as a police official, um, he was a constable. Um, there was an accident, and he had to he had to sit with a dead body and wait for the ambulance for two hours. And because they hadn't even given him a, a flashlight, he had to walk across the street and buy a newspaper and sit next to the, and he lit a fire next to the body and he sat next to a corpse for like two hours until the ambulance arrived. So, yeah, oh, sorry, I didn't expect to get emotional. Uh, yeah, but I just mean like after that, it's easy to forgive someone and think like, okay, cool, so maybe you missed a parent's mm. evening. It's fine, dude, like, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, there was a lot going on, and yeah, so I think, yeah, it kind of helped sort of make us closer as father and son. Yeah, no, for <clears> sure. <throat> um, the title of this talk is about <coughs> writing of a loved one. The, the, the books go into a lot more complexity and different, beautifully written, and as I said earlier, it will make you laugh and it will make you cry at the same time. And of course, the authors are going to be at the festival throughout the weekend and you'll be able to get into a lot more of the detail. But perhaps before I come to you for your questions, let me ask this, and it's the same question to everyone. The wonderful thing about a published book is that in 10, 15, 20, 50 years' time, it's going to be there. Mm -hmm. um, oh. Your son is going to pick it up and read it at some point. Yeah. Your wonderful daughter is going to pick it up and read it at some point. And your fantastic son is going to pick it up and read it at some point. Um, what are you hoping they're going to take away from it when, when they are off in age to fully comprehend what is contained in the book? It's another good question, eh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Africa, it is... Quarter to 11 on a Friday morning. <laughs> I am not even properly awake yet. <laughs> um, but no, you're right. You're right. And I think sometimes when we write, I think we do forget to keep that sort of top of mind, you know. But at the same time, I don't think we necessarily do have to police what we say when we write mm. because our kids will, will read it. Mm. Um, because outside of, of the lives they're going to live and the people they're going to become... Um, the conflict, trauma, and struggles they're going to have, what, you know, whatever they are. Um, parents are their own people as well, 
Yeah. You know, we're separate from just being someone's yeah. mother or someone's caregiver or anything we, or, or someone's daughter or whatever, you know, and, and as will, will they be. Um, and I think being a parent has, has taught me one thing, and that is, and I realized this ages ago, like I forgave my dad long before he forgave me, and to an extent it was also abusive towards myself because I shouldn't have in many ways. I should have worked through it. But I realized that he did the best he could with what he had. Mm. And he had trauma in his own life. And he grew up really hard. And maybe he too was not ready to be a parent, mm. you know. Um, he also didn't know how. And he made severe mistakes and you don't wa I don't want to repeat them. But I'm pretty sure my, my, my kids, you know, psychiatry or psychological bill is going to be as big as mine <laughs> when, you know, when he's older because we will mess up. And I think my hope is that when, when he reads these books, he'll realize there was some sense of awareness. Yeah. And maybe it wasn't entirely there. Um, but especially with years, the thing comparatively, um, when I compare it to Sorry Not Sorry, if he does want to read both, um, you'll see that there is room for growth and room for change and that people develop and they change their opinions and you know, maybe the next book will just be about how I sent him to idols and he became a rock star or something, <laughs> I don't know, you know. Um, but at the same time, at this age that he is now, I can almost 100% guarantee you that kids do not care who their parents are. Like, they don't care if you're Madonna or Haji or whoever, or if you're an author or you're famous or you're not famous. They could give two shits, you know. So for right now, all I can say is, he has absolutely no interest in reading these books, man. Like he's, <laughs> he's bored by these books to his skull. So <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, Haji does also write about, obviously, uh, her beautiful wife, uh, who keeps on checking her hair out on the, um, on the passenger car uh, when, uh, mirror thing. Uh, she also writes about... Uh, pants that are designed for women that don't have pockets and she, she raises a big issue about about that. So the book is a lot more about, you know, children and parents and <laughs> all of that. Uh, do read it, it's really good. Here's a thing by Haji Mohammed Davji. For you, Sarah Jane? Uh, that's such a great question. I was just thinking about <clears throat> it and, and I uh, three things I think. One is that that book is a love letter to my daughter. I don't want her to read it before she's 16 because it's hectic, but it's a love letter to her in terms of this is how much, this is what we went through. I hope by the time she may want to read it, it is literally a confirmation of everything we've told her. There would, cannot be any, that book is full on. There can't, she can't be picking that up and going, my dad sold my baby grow for heroin at 16. That can't happen. That conversation needs to have happened. I hope she looks at it and says, wow, my parents loved me enough and grew to love themselves enough to heal from the shit that happened to minimise the likelihood it passes on mm. to me. That's what I hope. Um, I hope that she looks at it if she wants to and still touch wood has two parents in recovery from drug and alcohol addiction who continue to do the work on themselves for the better of their kids. That's what I hope. I've got fuck all control over it. She probably will hate us both. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> what you will know is that you've loved her the best way you know how to. Yes, sir. And that, and that comes across in the book very, very strongly. And I do want to ask, but you don't have to answer it because you're going to have to read the book to uh, get the answer, whether... Enver showed up. <laughs> it's a, it's a, well, the real Enver show up, I think, was the title of, the, of that chapter. And it really, I, yeah, I have a thousand more questions, but that, that's not for today. Uh, and for you, uh, Rafua? Um, yeah, I think you, like, just sort of in writing, you kind of have, like, two schools of thought. Um, there's the, like, Richard Kapuczynski, who was, like, um, a journalist, um, who sort of mixed magical realism with journalism. He was of the opinion like that writing is like sacred work and you know it's a it's a divine commission and what have you. And then you have someone like David Foster Wallace, like very amazing writer, um, kind of a bit of a terrible human being, but who, you know, sort of viewed writing as a technology 
like a very sort of like, you know, um, like almost as, as a piece of code, like, you know, um, where you sort of like give meaning to like ideas. And I think, you know, I, you know, I was, I was, I was always aware of those two schools of thought when I was writing the book, because on one end, you know, I wanted to write, like I wanted to have an account you know, of my dad's career. So that was a sort of like journalistic account, like talking about who he was. But number two, like I always, I, I wanted the book to be about, you know, sort of like the, the, the emotional and sort of like, you know, psychological equipment it takes every day to work, you know, the kind of job my father did. And I hope, you know, whoever stumbles upon the book in 10, 15 years will one get like an accurate account of, you know, my dad, like as in, you know, number one as a biography, I hope you get to read it and you understand, you know, um, you know who Amos Manetta was as a detective. But it's sec secondary to that, you know, I'd like people to read it and get the impression of who he was as a father, as a human being, you know, what were his fears outside of his police work. Um, yeah, and just get a sense that, you know, a human being existed. I don't remember who's, what's this, um, who, who had a line called like, I, there, was a, there, there was a human who once lived here. But just, yeah, there was a human who once mm. lived in this body, who occupied this space, mm. who, worked, who, who walked this earth. I think, I hope, yeah, that's what I want people to I have no clue whether this was their intention or not. Uh, yeah. Men, and in most cases rightfully, get a bad rap in, in, in you know, general society right now. Mm. What this gave me insight to is a complexity of, of one man, and it is one man's story, mm -hmm. um, in a mess of this beautiful country of ours, because it is a messy country, but it is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And to find someone who is a man who, for all those years, wore the blue uniform, who is someone to celebrate, is such a joy. Mm -hmm. uh, thank and thank you for that, and thank you for honoring your father in that thank way. You. Thank you very much. All right, I, I am a talk show host, so I do apologize. <laughs> I've left you with only nine minutes. <laughs> Uh, for questions. Show of hands, please, and microphones will come to you, and if you can direct your question uh, to an author. If you don't ask questions, I'll just continue. Uh, there's, one, there's one right here at the front. I've been in therapy for a really, really long time um, and never talked about my dad to the extent where they've been able to say to me, forgive him for you. Um, but I think I, I had to do that in order to survive. I was in survival mode. Yeah. So sometimes when you forgive, it doesn't mean you process anything, but you go into survival mode and you just have to not maybe let go of some things, but you have to pack them away and, and move on, else you just mm -hmm. cannot live, mm -hmm. you know. And it's only after he died and I went back to therapy, because I, I, had, I had COVID for 23 weeks after he died. Um, and, and then we became parents and everything happened at the same time. And then I went to therapy and when I told her stories of my father, you know, I would laugh and I would be like, you know, he did this and he did that and, you know, he was so funny and witchy and like whatever. And she would just sit there shocked and she'd be like, but that's abuse. Why are you laughing? Mm. You know? And I'd go because if I, I mean, why am I, you know, why am I laughing? And I realized that because laughter is my survival mode. And she said, you don't have to forgive him, mm. you know? You can accept that that's who he was. You can learn that those were his circumstances, but it doesn't make what he did right. Making peace with something is very different from just forgiving and not accepting it, or just accepting it for, for what it was. And that's a process I had to go through, and I often I, I go through it a lot now because I look at my own son and the kind of parent I want to be, and which is so dynam dynamic and, and, and complex and, you know, you can't, again, two things can be true at the same time. Um, my dad was abusive, but he also taught me so much and he was such a great guy 
in so many ways. Mm. Um, and in as much as he threw me out the house and forced me to be independent, I don't think I would be if I didn't learn those lessons. And some people do and some people don't. And some people land on their feet and some people don't. And, you know, I, it, it has just taught me that I want to do better in so many ways and I don't want to repeat those mistakes. And I think when anyone becomes a parent, that's what they always say. We don't want to be our parents, mm. you know. Mm. Um, but it's also taught me that we're just dynamic and we are who we are. And like, you know, like SJ said, like all we can do is work really, really, really hard on ourselves so that our problems don't become mm. their problems. Because mm. um, no kid should ever have to carry the weight of your own circumstance. So true. So mm. true. Uh, there's a microphone at the... Sorry, did one of the grade nine learners have a question? Right at the back there. And then we'll come to the lady in the front afterwards. Right at the back. So my question is not specific to anyone, but I would like to know what is the hardest thing about being a writer? Being poor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is... I mean, SJ has a lovely job as a, as a, a radio journalist, and she's a host, and she's amazing. Um, you know, I for, I'm so, sorry, I, I have no short memory. Um, <laughs> has a great job as a journalist, you know, Africa has a great job as, as a working journalist and a broadcaster. I'm not an author, so that doesn't count That for is me. also true. <laughs> I am a career writer, that is all I do. It's what I live for. It used to be my bread and butter, but now it is my two minute noodles maybe twice a week. So, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, that's, that's what you're looking at, but you know what, you don't do it for, money comes and money goes, and, you don't, oh God, you do do it for the money, guys. You do, you do. And when the money is good, it's so good. It's, it's so good. Um, but you also do it because just, you just can't live if you, if you do anything else. Are you thinking of being a writer yourself? Please do. Do it. Write. Yeah. Write. We, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm definitely not yes. saying don't be a writer because no, go ahead and write that book. it's Start the most it beautiful thing in the world. I it really is. May I? But to that, I think there's, there's sometimes a, like a, a very fundamental mistake we make about being a, a writer. Being published doesn't necessarily, yes, you know, sir. the fact that you're not published doesn't mean that you're not a writer. Mm -mm. So when people ask when I became a writer, it wasn't when I was 19 when I first published. I, I, I was a writer from the time I was 13 mm. because I was writing regularly from the time you're 13. So yeah. my, my point is you don't wait to be a writer. If mm. you're writing now, like I'd, I'd call you a writer as well. So you don't yes. have to... I'm yeah. saying don't wait for anyone to give you permission to yeah. be a writer. Yeah. 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 Out of interest, do you remember the first thing you wrote when you were 13? Uh, yeah. I mean, I remember the first thing that sort of, um, yeah, it was in grade eight. And then, you know, um, it was a journey to the center of the earth. I thought it was, um, you know, just an essay. But then a teacher showed it to um, the matric class. And I was like, OK, maybe there's something there. Maybe there's something <laughs> there. <laughs> See, Shamia, there's a role for teachers and, and <laughs> encourage. Uh, Ma'am. Uh, one comment and one question. The comment is for Haji. Um, I had the same experience with my father, but I was very grateful that it happened straight after university. Um, <coughs> uh, first after school and then after university, where he gave my sister a better uh, compliment by giving her something better than he'd given me. I was given whatever it was. I was growing up in Harare and I was given... You can go to the barter shoe sale and buy three pairs of shoes because you did so well on your O-levels. And my sister was taken out to dinner at the Meekles Hotel. And I made the mistake of asking the question, why did I get that? And she, well, we knew you'd pass. We expected that. Mm. So that's what you got. And I finished university, but nobody else in the family went. So I got a visit to the Dolphinarium. Just going to say. So I got that. But it was the feeling of... We knew you were going to, you are our favorite, you're the cleverest, so you got secondhand shoes, I mean, not secondhand, sales shoes, and your sister got a fancy dinner. So, but I was told that a long time ago, and now I don't expect. Um, it was not on his deathbed, thankfully. The other question is, um, of the three books, 
during the, the research, did you ask your parents questions? Because uh, I found asking questions, sometimes you get answers that you don't really want to hear. And um, did that happen quite a lot? Uh, the, the three drafts, you mean? Yes. Yeah, the three drafts, yeah. I'm so tired of talking. You guys go first. Yeah, 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 go first. <laughs> but that was your What's the question? question? That wasn't for me. It's a question for everyone. Yeah, so, so, so in questions that when you were going from draft to draft to draft? Um, honestly, I, I didn't because in my household, like, I was parenting for so long. I was the parent to my mother. You know, I was looking after her. And to this day, I still kind of parent my mother. And I had to work through that. I was the parent to my two younger siblings because no one was ever around, you know. And in terms of my dad, I had to be an adult because I had to take things on the nose. And also anyone who grows up in a brown family knows that you don't ask questions like why, you know, or why me. You take it on the chin, you be quiet, you get a slap, you go to your room, you're not allowed to cry in public, you know, you just, you just do all those things. Um, and to be quite honest, I mean, this might sound, you know, a little bit arrogant, but... I'd been privy to their information and their stories and their problems for so long. Like I remember one day my dad beat my mom and I had to sit outside the door and pass her tissues under the door and take care of her. And this wasn't a once-off thing. This happened all the time, you know. And so I was privy to so much of their relationship that I probably shouldn't have been. Mm. And so much of their trauma and their, what they were going through and their struggles and how they took it out on me and me having to then protect my siblings from all of that, that I felt like I had more than enough information. The information I didn't have was the information of why I took it mm. and why, in a way, at 38, I'm still taking it and why am I not doing anything about it? Because my, my, my siblings spoke back all the time and they asked questions and, and I did it. And my mother this year legitimately said to me, I would hear you cry in your bed every single night and, and go to sleep and not do anything about it because I was too afraid to get out of bed. And that in itself is, is an answer to me because I lived it, I already know that. So yeah, that's sure. my answer. It's often said that the best times we've had on earth are usually with those we love. And we found out this morning that sometimes the worst times we've had in our lives are with those we love. Thank you for having the courage to write about those you love. Thank you for giving us an insight in your world. Thank you for the heart-rending, heartwarming, funny and painful reflections and sharings. Um, I cannot stress enough the importance for you to go and buy this book. Uh, these books, read them, number one, because it's good for you, number two, because we need to pay for Haji, number three, <laughs> number three, because the authors are going to be downstairs for the next hour available to sign these books. Thank you very much for coming out and have a wonderful rest of your festival. And thank you to Africa as well for being a great host. Thank you guys, thank you very much. Thank you.